You may turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, where we have spent a lot of time during this conference. And my uh, subject for this afternoon session is God's image fallen in man. It's, um, it's always precarious to be the speaker after lunch, and it is very easy to put everyone right to sleep. And I um, hope you'll be able to stay awake uh, with me. Uh, so let's, let's read together Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the, of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Uh, back in the fall of 1977, I enrolled at the Trinity College in Bristol, England, and my systematic theology professor, J.I. Packer, assigned the reading of Burkauer's Man in the Image of God. And that was, for me, a regrettable choice because I very quickly found myself immersed in the inner mural debates amongst Dutch theologians that I found to be nearly incomprehensible at least for my 22-year-old brain, it was just beyond me as I tried to plow my way as a first-year divinity student through uh, Burkauer. So despite my false start, it's hard for me to overstate the importance of the subject of man made in the image of God. If I can just uh, quickly summarize, it's the image of God and man is the basis for human dignity, nearly all that we have to say about that is based upon the image. It's, uh, founda it's foundational for, the, uh, for an, an inspirational of the endeavors uh, to start uh, and found hospitals and orphanages and universities and universal education. It's uh, foundational for such notions as equality, universal rights, democracy, free markets, limited government. It's uh, the basis for the work of redemption. God does not provide a savior for angels, but he does for human beings. Why? Because they're made in his image and God loves his image. It is uh, the basis for our understanding of the dignity and sanctity of all human life. All that we have to say and all that has been developed uh, in connection with the well-being, the welfare of humanity has been anchored in and rooted in our understanding of man made in the image of God. I commend to you a book by the, an English author by the name of Tom Holland. His book is entitled Dominion. It's massive. Uh, but uh, he points out that the whole idea of universal rights is, is unknown in the history of the world and in any other place in the world aside from the Christian West. He says, you can go back into antiquity. There's no concept whatsoever of equality. Uh, there's no uh, concept of basic human rights, not amongst the ancient Greeks, not amongst the ancient Romans, not in any of the ancient civilizations. It's not until uh, Christianity is established and it spreads that these concepts begin to take root. And they, um, uh, they, they progress over, over time. And, and even today, as you, as you go around the world, um, you don't find uh, these ideas of equality and of basic rights. You don't find them in the Islamic world. You don't find them in tribal uh, communities. You don't find them in the communist world and, and fascist world. Uh, in other words, uh, this is the legacy of Christianity. Uh, it's Christianity that brought this understanding of basic human equality and basic human rights. It's only been where Christianity has spread that these have been known in the history of the world and all around the world. Um, and so it's, 
it's a vital concept. It's one that it's vital that we retain and that it's vital that we understand. So I want to try to answer the question, what is the image? Uh, what if that image is retained by us after the fall? And then try to work out some of the implications of the human condition. So first, let's start with what is the image? What is the image as it was created from uh, the beginnings. And, and I'm starting there because I don't think I can, I can deal with the issue of God's image fallen in man until we know what the image itself is. Uh, so typically, that discussion has fallen along one or more of the following categories depending upon who the author might be. So in the passage we just read, we read that, we are, that humanity is created in the image and likeness of God. I take those to be synonyms. Two ways of saying the same thing. In the likeness of God, in the image of God. It's, it's two ways of expressing the distinctive quality that characterizes human beings. So how do we, uh, how do we unfold uh, how do we proceed in examining what exactly that amounts to? So, number one, it's, it's intellectual. God is a thinking being, a knowing being. And we have, corresponding to that, minds with the ability to reason, uh, and reason soundly according to moral and logical categories. And we find here with Genesis 1 and 2 that Adam understands the commands that he is given, what he is to do and what he is not to do. He understands his duties uh, and his, the, the prohibitions. So in Genesis 2, verses 19 and 20, and now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every, uh, and, and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. And then, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the fit for him, it gives you an idea of what was going on with the naming of the animals. He was naming them according to what was fit for them, what was appropriate to them, what corresponded to them. These are not mere labels that are being attached to the animals. Um, Adam is perceiving the character of the animal and giving a name to that animal. Now, when we name our, our dogs and cats and our pets, it's, it's just a label. It's just so that when we call them, they'll respond to us. That's not the case with, with naming here in Genesis, or for that matter, throughout the Bible. The name speaks of the nature of the thing. The names correspond to the nature of God. The, the names of the, the people of God correspond to their, their role and their function and their character. Uh, and so it is, we see this, this discerning capacity with Adam. He's able to name the Adams, to give them suitable and apt names. And in the process, perceives that there's not one that is suitable and apt for him. Adam lived in conformity with the will of God and in conformity with the nature of things as God had made them. Uh, looking again at verse uh, 21, where we read, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And verse 23, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones. He, see, he understands. She corresponds to him. This is the one that's apt for him. Uh, th this is one who is suited to him. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she's been taken out of man. He, he, he understands the nature of things, her nature, his nature, and the suitability and the compatibility uh, between uh, the two of them. So Matthew Henry, uh, in his comments on this passage, uh, he says of, of Adam, he had a habitual conformity to all of his natural of all of his natural powers to the whole will of God. His understanding saw divine things clearly and truly, and there were no errors or mistakes in his knowledge. He then goes on, his thoughts were easily brought and fixed to the best subjects, so there was no vanity, 
nor, nor ungovernableness in, in them. So number one, there's the intellectual. N- number two, there was the volitional. God is a God who decides. God is a God who determines and distinguishes. And so Adam has this capacity to decide. He's able to choose between options. Uh, he's able to choose the best options according to what is moral and right and what is logical and good according to the nature of things. So in chapter 1, verse 28, he's told to rule over the creation, to exercise dominion over it, but he's not told how to do that. That, that will need to be discerned according to the nature of things. Uh, verse 129, he's, uh, he is to plant. Um, we read there verse, one, uh, verse 29, Uh, God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Uh, And and so, uh, the plants are there for food, but he's not told which of the plants are for food. There, There would undoubtedly be plants that were to be eaten and there would be plants that were not suitable for human beings. And so he has to discern which is good for eating, which is not good for eating. Uh, chapter 2, verse 5 uh, says, There was no bush in the field. When, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. And then continuing, And there was no man to work the ground. Uh, drop down to verse 15. The Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So he's being given a task. He's being assigned the responsibility of working the ground. But he's not told how to do that. That's something he's going to have to discern. He's going to have to come to an understanding of the nature of things, when to plant, when to harvest, how to care for the crops. He's going to have to discern and decide. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 16 uh, says he was commanded and he now will have to decide is he's going to decide uh, he's going to need to decide whether he's going to obey or disobey what's been commanded to him uh, number 3 there's the emotional i'm getting a little speculative here but when you go back up to chapter 2 verses 18 through 20 and god himself declares that it is not good can we say that in an unfallen uh, situation that there would have been a, a, something of disappointment in Adam. Uh, he sees there is nothing that corresponds. In the, with the animals, there were corresponding animals, but there was nothing corresponding to him. Would he participate in some um, sense that things were not right, things were not good? Even God says it's not good, and so there would be some recognition of that and the absence of the greater good and some disappointment with with that, and so some emotional response, some state of mind that would correspond to unfallen emotions, and then the response in verse 23, this at last seems to be an outburst of joy. This at last is one that is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, one suitable for me and fit for me and right for me and corresponds to me, complementary to me. And so, an emotional element. Let me go back to to Matthew Henry. So, again, Henry said that uh, Adam had a habitual conformity of all of his natural powers to the whole will of God. There's the volitional side, his understanding. There's the intellectual. His affections were all regular, he says. So there's the emotional. They were all regular, and he had no inordinate appetites or passions. Uh, He says, thus holy, thus happy were our first parents in having the image of God placed upon them. There was a sense of contentedness and well-being that he would have experienced in an unfallen state. So the intellectual, the volitional, the emotional, uh, the relational... God is a God eternally in relation. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, eternally happy with each other, content with each other, rejoicing uh, in each other, sharing their mutual glory. So God is is not uh, in solitude in heaven. He's in relationship. God is a social God in that respect. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relating to each other even as they are one God together. 
So God is a relational God, and so Adam is created with a capacity for fellowship with God and for fellowship with those who correspond to him. And so once again, back to 2.18. It was not good to be in isolation because he's made for society. That is part of the image. That corresponds to what is true of God. God is a social God. And so he's created, 127, male and female, a social, a relational being. Fifth, there's the dominical. Chapter 1, verse 28, he's told to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. God is a God who rules. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. And so the, this dominical, this this, this um, charge to subdue and to govern is a reflection of God's universal rule. And then there's the moral. Uh, the restoration of the likeness of God in Ephesians 4.24 is said to be a, a restoration to righteousness and true holiness. If we look at if we look at uh, Westminster Confession Chapter 4, Section 2, the confession says that God created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. That's borrowed straight from Ephesians 4, uh, Ephesians 4, 24. Uh, After his own image, having the law of God written in their hearts, uh, God had given them commands. And he had written, the remnant of that knowledge, of course, continues with us today, according to the Apostle Paul, Romans 2, 14 and 15. Uh, So it would have been unambiguous and immediately perceived in Adam that he knew the law of God. He knew the will of God uh, from the very beginning in in in, in a comprehensive way. Having the law of God written in their hearts and the power to fulfill it, and yet under a possibility of transgressing being left to the, to the um, liberty of their own will. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, God made man upright. Uh, there was no sin in the world, yet there was the possibility of sin coming into the world. So he had the capacity either to not sin or to sin. So in all of these ways, let me go over them one more time. The intellectual, the volitional, the emotional, the relational, the dominical, and the moral, all of this is a reflection of God himself. That's what it means to be made in his image, reflecting the incommunicable attributes of God. In that way, we are created in his image. Uh, We are not created immutably. We are not... uh, We are not infinite. We don't share the communicable attributes, but we do share the incommunicable. Uh, Those absolute attributes of of God uh, are not uh, an aspect of the image, but the incommunicable, uh, the incommunicable are. We are not by nature infinite, eternal, or unchangeable, or independent, but we are relational, dominical, moral, you know, emotional, Um, volitional, intellectual. All right, then let's move on to the fallen image. Uh, Dr. Packer used a very effective analogy, I think, in relating the human condition to Tintern Abbey. So if you cross the Bristol Channel into Wales, you don't drive too far before you come to the ruins of Tintern Abbey, made famous by one of the English poets. I forget which one it is. But I think it's Wordsworth. But uh, um, Tintern Abbey uh, is in ruins. And he says, this is, this, is, this is the condition of humanity. We are made in the image of God. You can see the greatness of humanity. That, that is still evident. That is still, um, to, still visible to us. We see evidence of that all the time. Something of the greatness and the grandeur of humanity. And yet humanity is in ruins, like the abbey. You can see what a magnificent structure this thing was. But it's not what it used to be. It is now a ruin. And so that's, uh, that is, is, I think, the right perspective to have on the image 
of God. So if we go back to the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 6, section 2, uh, says that by sin, they, Adam and Eve, fell from their original righteousness and communion with God and so became dead in their sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. And then if anything even stronger, uh, sec, uh, section 4 of chapter 6, from this original corruption whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good and wholly inclined to all evil. That's the image in ruins. Or as the Apostle Paul puts it, Romans 3, 10 through 12, there's none righteous, no, not one, there is none who understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. So the, the image of God is, is shattered for sure, yet it's also retained. So if we fast forward to Genesis 9, 6, following the flood, uh, humanity was in such a condition, there was nothing to do but to destroy the whole human race and start all over with Noah. And then some restraints were built into the system to slow the progress of evil, and among those is capital punishment. But the reasoning behind it is, Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. So you take the life of another human being, you have to pay the ultimate penalty. Not something less than the ultimate penalty. Wrongly, unjustly take the life of another human being. There can't be some lesser penalty than the greater penalty. So great is this sin. So great is this evil that the maximum infliction, the maximum punishment must be inflicted upon you. And that is you, you, you surrender your own life. So whoever sheds the blood of man, so terrible is that crime, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. It's something like counterintuitive. Um, and, and so the argument you hear today against capital punishment, the, the, the argument is that is itself a, um, that is a, a denigration of, 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 of human life, a, a, a belittling of, of human life, a, 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 re, a reduction of the sanctity of human life. When we when we um, execute uh, murderers. The logic of the Bible is exactly the opposite of that. It's no, and no the, the maximum penalty must be inflicted. Why? Because man is made in the image of God. It is so terrible a crime that this maximum punishment must be inflicted uh, because this is, the, this is the worst of all crimes against humanity. To rob somebody of their life. You are attacking the image of God in, in, in other human beings. The same logic is in Gen, uh, J, James 3, 9. Uh, speaking of uh, sins of speech, James says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. This is something you must not do. Why must you not curse other human beings? Uh, because they're made in the image of God. And when, you, and when you curse them, you're cursing God in whose image they are made. You can, at, at the, one and the same time, bless God who you cannot see, and then when he becomes visible to you in the form of another human being, curse that image. There's that, that in, incongruity between blessing the God you can't see and cursing the image when it stands before you. So the image is retained by the human race. It is in ruins, but it is retained. Uh, it is still present. And so we need to examine our fallen image and, and try to discern how it is retained and how we are to respond uh, to it. Um, so we start with the fact that our souls are poisoned, we are corrupt in every faculty, mind, will, emotion, and yet human beings are capable of greatness. And the image of God in them is to be respected. So, let's take a look at the image under all of those categories, mentally. Do we see something of the greatness of the human race? Well, think about the Industrial Revolution, the Transportation Revolution, the Information 
revolution of our own age. Uh, the progress that has been made in medicine and in, in the communication, uh, in the development of the military, in the development of uh, agriculture. The um, noetic effects of sin are profound, as the theologians call them, but you can see the greatness of the human race. We're able to create these things, these remarkable things with their extraordinary computing power. I have access to all kinds of information. I push a little button and I say, tell, tell me when Christopher Columbus was born. And the, the answer springs up. We're able to send spaceships to, to Mars and land men on the moon. I mean, humanity is cr capable of tremendous things. We, we have uh, the paintings of Rembrandt, the poetry of, of, of Milton, the music of Bach and and, and Handel and, and, and Beethoven and, and Mozart. Uh, remarkable human uh, achievements. When I, uh, when I prepare my sermons, I play for background music. Some people you should think you shouldn't use classical music in that way, but I do. Uh, Mozart's piano concertos, the slower uh, movements of the piano concertos. They are conducive to thinking for me, and they are exquisitely beautiful. It is as though they dropped right out of heaven. They are so beautiful. Humanity is, is, is capable of great things. However, our power of reasoning has been poisoned by bias, by self-interest. Again, I repeat, the theologian's language, the noetic effects of sin. I think, I think in just recent months, we've seen the appeal to us all to follow the science. But what we found over and over again was that, was, was that the culture is willing to do anything but follow the science. And following the science has meant any of a number of different things. So in connection with the pandemic, wear masks, don't wear masks, social distance, three feet, six feet, 12 feet, vaccinations, boosters, um, most recently lifting of all restrictions in most places. How much of that was actually following the data? How much of that was based on data? Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes there were political considerations, clearly, that were dominant. And it wasn't following the science at all. It was following the politics and what was politically expedient or politically demanded. Our abortion issue, uh, the woman's right to determine anything in connection with her own body. Well, follow the science is that which is conceived within her part of her own body. And genetically, it's not. It's a, it's a foreign bit of tissue, isn't it? And it's eventually going to be ejected. And so if you follow the science, you realize, no, this is a distinctive human being that, that has been created in the womb. It's a, it has an entirely different genetic code. That's why when it comes out, it... it, it it may not look exactly like the mother. It may look more like the father than the mother or the grandfather or the grandmother than, 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 than uh, the mother because it's not a product merely of the mother. It's not a replication of the mother. It's not a, 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 it's, 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 it's not a part of the body of the mother. And yet that's the argument that's made and that's supposedly a scientific argument. The normalizing of homosexuality Follow the science on that? Really? Is it following physiology? Is it, uh, you know, the physiology of the body, the two bodies, the male and the female, organs which unite? Where was the male organ designed to be placed? You blush even to talk about these things. What organ in the human race was designed to receive the male reproductive or organ? What does the physiology teach us? Follow the science. Follow the biological science. What is the meaning of the union of the male and the female? What is the meaning behind the, the organs that God has given to men and to women? The biological meaning is 
Reproduction, it produces human life. So you follow the physiology and the biology, what do you end up? You end up with the union of a man and a woman and no other sort of union as being in conformity with the science, following the science of physiology and the science of biology and the meaning of the design of, of the human body and the purpose behind reproductive organs, which surprise surprises reproduction. How about the normalizing of transgenderism and that you can be a woman ta uh, trapped in the body of a man and a man in the body of a woman. What does the science tell you? The science tells you that every single cell in every single body is either male or female. Your genes are either male genes and your genes are, or, or they're female genes. The science would say you are, in terms of gender, what you are in biology, and that's all anybody in the human race in all of recorded history has ever understood until the recent, like five minutes ago. So yes, our, 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 is, is, uh, is man, is the image now flawed in, in, in mentally, intellectually? Yes. Romans 1, 18 to 21, the Apostle Paul speaks of us becoming futile in our thinking and our hearts being darkened, having become fools, he says. That's the problem of the human race. We're foolish. And our thinking is corrupt. Our thinking is, is governed by our darkened hearts and our self-interest and our bias and our prejudice and our, and, and our bigotry and our, our, our various agendas. We are capable of talking ourselves into almost anything because we're fallen. Or the image is, is, is corrupted. Secondly, volitionally. Volitionally. According to Romans 1, we know God. His invisible attributes, eternal power, and divine nature are all clearly seen. Romans 1, 18 and 19. Romans 2, we know the, the, the law of God. It's written in our hearts. It's been written in our hearts ever since the garden. So we know right and wrong, even if we know it uh, incompletely, this side of the fall. We knew it perfectly in the garden. We know it imperfectly now, but we still have it written there. It's still, we have a conscience it speaks to us on the basis of right and wrong as God has defined such. The problem is volition. We won't submit to what we know. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. We worship the creature rather than the creator. We insist upon our autonomy, our independence. We will not have God to be our God. We won't allow ourselves to be limited and restricted and confined the way that the law of God, the will of God insists that we limit ourselves and restrict ourselves. Psalm 2, this is, this is exactly the way the rulers of the earth and their followers find all of this. They find them bonds and chains. Psalm 2, suffocating the life out of them so they will not repent, they will not submit, they will not believe. They cho we choose wrongly. Why? Because our volitions are fallen. Emotionally, our, our passions and our appetites, they're out of control. The emotive self is the sovereign self. And so how do I go about establishing my identity? Well, in a fallen world, I am not what God says I am, which is the only reliable source. See what the Christian religion says. Do I want to know who I am? I go to God's Word. He, de he determines who I am. He declares who I am and what I, what I am. So it comes from outside of me. I don't look within. I look outside. I go out to hear from God um, my identity, who I am, what I am, what, what, uh, what I am uh, to do. What, is, what are my duties? What are my responsibilities? What, what am I called upon to do? All that comes from outside of me as God speaks to me and informs me. Well, the modern notion is, the notion today is, no, I look within. I shut out everything outside of me. I shut out my family. I, I shut out my church. I, I shut out uh, the nation. All outside influences. I only look within. And, and that determines what I am and what I will do. And it's all feeling based. I am what I feel myself to be. And what I feel myself to be, we might point out, we feel ourselves to be only for the moment. It's a very a transient basis upon which to establish. You know, but even in, even 
establish identity. Um, even in the Christian community, ba- back when I was coming of age, oh, it's so fun to take some of you back a few years. Debbie Boone came out with that song. It can't be wrong if it feels so right. Is that, is that, is that a Christian sentiment? It can't be wrong if it feels so right. Are, are your emotions reliable? Can you trust them? Can you just follow your heart? That's just something people say. Just follow your heart. Oh, yeah, is the heart reliable? Can you trust your heart? Can you trust your emotions? Are they somehow outside of the fall? So that part of the image has been retained so that we have, this infallible, we have infallible emotions. We can go wherever they lead us. No, our emotions are, are out of control. They are utterly unreliable. And so we can't say it can't be wrong if it feels so right. No, but what our culture says, uh, if you suppress your emotions, uh, then you're going to psychologically damage a person. If you tell them not to act on their emotions, um, th- then they, they won't uh, develop to be what they really are meant to be and what, what they, they want to, view, to be. You, you, are, you are damaging them. You are harming them. Uh, You're not allowing those emotions to be expressed. They're not being allowed to find themselves. Um, You're you're, you're stifling their creativity and their self-awareness. So is, is the restricting of the emotions and the governing of the emotions by the mind and by what's right and wrong, is that psychological psychologically damaging, or is that what it means to be a civilized human being? Is that I control my emotions. I allow my emotions to be governed by conviction of what's right and what's wrong and what's appropriate and what's inappropriate and what's suitable and what's not suitable. And our, then our relationships are fallen and ruined as well. We're alienated and enemies of God. That's the Bible language. Enemies in Romans 5, alienated in Romans 8. And then in terms of human relationships, we hold them together with a very thin thread. And so conflict breaks out, doesn't it? Amongst our friends, amongst our, with spouses, with children. I, I, I um, speak regularly of my first seven years in Savannah as the seven years war. Um, that's one thing that the seminaries did not prepare me for was the intensity of the battles within the church. Um, and how cruel people could be, how, 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 um, how awful the treatment of other believers uh, could be within, within the Christian community. And it was a seven years war. Uh, and it was all about power. That's the other thing I didn't understand. So much of human behavior is about control, to be able to control, to exercise power. And wealth almost is just having meaning because it allows you to control. It allows you to to exercise the power. And that's what it was all about. Who was going to control the church? Seven years war. Then I had one of my best friends come and visit me just last week. And he described what happened with him in the ministry over a period of 14 years. And I turned to Emily when he left, and I said, you know what? What he went through makes what we went through in our seven-year war sound like the peaceable kingdom. I mean to tell you what they were doing in that church. It was just awful. Relationships are messed up. Marriages are messed up. Broken relationships, left, right, and, and center. And then, on, the, on, the, on that's the... You know, the more immediate level, what about between the nations? What are we witnessing in Ukraine right now? There's hardly been a time in the history of the world where war wasn't uh, being, wars weren't being fought somewhere in the world someplace. It is the habitual state of the human race, war. Constantly fighting uh, with each other. Uh, Then the dominical. There's such imbalance in exercising rule. The pendulum seems to swing from the irresponsible to the oppressive. You take the the lazy husband who wants to just come home, 
sit uh, down in his lounge chair, kick up his feet, and not move. And just relax, and he's willing to let his wife do whatever she'll do. And because she's more responsible than he is, uh, she ends up doing everything. So you have that on the one hand, and then you have the domineering, oppressive husband who is a tyrant, who, oh, he's, well, I grew up in very much a blue-collar neighborhood in Southern California, and I had a little friend a couple of blocks away. I used to go over to his house, and his father was a master sergeant who had fought in World War II on, in Europe, and I can, he brought home a Belgian bride, and I can remember so clearly overhearing him more than once shouting out, I'm the head of this house, as the combat, the combat between husband and wife was going on. I'm the head of this house. It seems that this, this is the problem. We're either irresponsible and won't exercise leadership, won't take charge, won't fulfill our responsibilities, won't uh, carry out our duties, or, or we're op oppressive and domineering in, in, a, in a way that is uh, harmful. And so we're fallen in our exercise of dominion as well. We're not, we're not rightly ruling over the creation. Uh, we, we're instead, we're ruining creation or we're worshiping creation. All right, you got the whole spectrum here today. I mean, the problem a, a few decades back was probably, you know, dumping chemicals into the water supply. Uh, today, the problem is we're bowing down and worshiping the water supply. Or the animals, uh, the darter fish that are, de de darter snails that are dependent upon the water supply. Now, now we've gone from, from the, the ruination of, of, of worship, of, of, of nature, to the worship of nature. We can't seem to get it right, our, pro our, our responsibility to exercise dominion. Same, same with parents. There's the lazy parent, the children run over the top of them. The house is total chaos. It is a nightmare to visit them because the kids are just out of control. So you have that, the response, the, the refusal of the parent to properly exercise dominion over the children, to rule the household, to rear the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And then there's the abuse of parent. So you've got the abuse of husband, the domineering husband, you've got the abuse of parent. who, you know, beats, beats his children and um, is, a, is a tyrant in, in, in the house. And I, I shouldn't let the women off so easily because there's plenty of wives who absolutely domineer the house. And if the husband doesn't do what she wants, he will pay a price. He will be shunned He'll get the silent treatment. He'll sleep on the couch. She's got a lot of weapons, and she's not afraid to use them. The prop, dominion again, the rule. It's out of control. It's, it's, uh, it's warped. It's imbalanced. The pendulum swings back and forth uh, from irresponsibility to oppression. And then sixth and lastly, the moral. And here's really the root problem that is that from Top to bottom, we are corrupt, corrupted by original sin and characterized by total depravity in that every faculty of ours is poisoned by sin. We are always doing wrong or doing right for the wrong reasons. That's why we've got locks on our doors and alarms on our houses and police and courts and judges and prisons. Just think of the social cost. Uh, because of moral corruption, the cost of maintain, maintaining some semblance of order in society because of the moral corruption that, that lies at the heart of human nature. Uh, so that's a pretty bleak picture that we paint of the remnants of the image. The remnants are there. We're still in the image of God. We don't curse the image. We take the life of the image. We forfeit our own life. That's how sacred human life remains. That's what dignity remains inherent in human life. But nevertheless, listen to the Apostle Paul. He says, Ephesians 4, 17 to 19, 
You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. There's the intellectual problem. They are darkened in their understanding. Again, the intellect. Alienated from the life of God. There's the relational. Because of the ignorance that is in them. There's the intellectual again. Due to the hardness of their heart. There's the emotional. They have become callous. And have given themselves up to sensuality. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. There's again the moral and the relational. What's uh, the solution to the image fallen in man? Well, you're going to have to go back and listen to the tape of H.B. Charles's sermon that preceded this one. This was about the re- that was about the restoration of the image. How is the image restored? There's only one way to restore it. There's only one cure for humanity. There's only one way to cleanse us of our sin and re- restore the image. It's in Christ. He alone is able to transform human nature. The restoration in this world will not be complete. It will only be completed in glory, but there will be substantial restoration of each one of these things. There will be a a, a restoration of of clear and correct thinking. There will be a restored ability uh, to exercise the will in believing and obeying God, uh, a restoration of of proper and right and proportionate emotions, a a restoration of human relationships, a restoration of our correct understanding of the exercise of dominion. As Jesus said, we are leaders, but not like the Gentiles lead. No, we we, we exercise a servant leadership. And in summary, there will be a moral Uh, restoration that that comes about in Christ. Because we become new creatures in Him, and the old passes away, and all things become new. We are born again to a new life. We're buried with Christ in baptism, raised up in newness of life. So we're restored into His likeness, not perfectly in this life, but nevertheless, substantially, as we pray together. Our Father in heaven is, we, we look at the, the loss of the image and, and, and contemplate our ruins. Uh, we cannot but uh, grieve for the human race. And yet also give thanks that, that you have initiated the restoration of the image, the likeness of God to be found in Christ. Uh, And oh, that your gospel might spread so that the fullness of the dignity and sanctity of all human lives would be clearly seen uh, through your gospel message. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching this special presentation of PCRT Online, presented by the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. We appreciate the prayerful support from Alliance Friends that keeps this and all of the broadcast, event, and online publishing ministries growing. Would you consider becoming a friend of the Alliance? Your monthly support goes a long way, and the benefits are many. Visit AllianceNet.org friend to find out more.